live. Hi. We're live, guys. <laughs> guys, we are so amped. Super hot topic today. We are talking about spay, neuter, and our animals. And we are here with the legendary Dr. Odette Sutter. And she is a holistic veterinarian, DVM, the author of What Your Vet Never Told You. She is, uh, also has the clinic, the Animal Peak Health Center. And uh, what else? We're super amped. We're yeah. super amped to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's always great to see you guys. You you're just so amazing, and you know I love all that you guys do over in in Dubai. But you're also spreading the word everywhere else. So it's just incredible. I'm really happy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We are obviously we're, like we're so happy for veterinarians and holistic veterinarians like you who are just amazing and sharing so, so much free information. And I have to correct Larry there because it's called the, do you want to say what your website is called? Because uh, Peak Animal Health Center, but I'm going to have a new one very soon. Oh, okay. really? So we'll drop that in the link sec in the comment section. As okay. Soon as that's yeah, available. so <laughs> there are so many amazing videos there and like, it's always so amazing to get you know, first hand knowledge from holistic veterinarians because, you know, it really takes a village to get all this great information out there. So thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, I mean, it takes a village, including everybody who's listening here, you know, and, and as I shared a little bit earlier, um, all the information that we collect, and sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of cross posting real quick, <laughs> but I think I'm, I'm done now. All right. Anyways, I'm back. Um, you know, as I shared with you guys earlier, just briefly, it's like, you know, all the information that we're sharing is basically being fed into the field of consciousness and knowledge of this whole planet. So, yeah. you know, all of what we do and all that everybody is doing is so important to raise the consciousness and knowledge on this planet. Um, so anyways, it takes all of us, you know, you know, sure. I, I, your guys are doing the interviews. I'm spreading some information, you know, I'm giving the information, but it's everybody else who's spreading it and, mm -hmm. and acting on that information that is really making the biggest difference. So it takes all of us. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for everyone who is now sharing this live with all of the yes. friends and in all of the groups. <laughs> Um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about spay and neuter, which is such an incredibly important topic. We're going to be talking about when is the best age to neuter if you're going to neuter and spay. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the impacts of spay and neutering, the question of should we be doing it at all or not, but also, which is very important to know and very um, important or I guess uh, uh, personally important for me and Larry as well is because we've spayed our dog too young and we really want to know on uh, how to best support our dog who has been spayed too young because there are some health complications that could arise with being spayed too young or neutered too young. So we're definitely going to talk about that as well for anyone who has a dog who's been spayed very young or neutered very young. And uh, we're also going to be talking about some possibly better alternatives to spaying and neutering. So make sure to stay till the end to find all the answers to this. And um, yeah, shall we dive right in? Shall we ask yes. a question? Oh, I, I think. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, okay. I'm ready. Um, for everyone who's watching right now, just drop your questions uh, down below and we are going to have uh, um, some time later to ask uh, your questions to Odette and you'll be able to get some answers. So the first question that we would like to talk about is you know, in a perfect world where we can all be very responsible pet owners, where, you know, we, we do... The, the topic of spay and neuter is often very controversial because there are a lot of you know, people who cannot be responsible and cannot ensure that an unspayed dog or an unneutered dog is always, um, I don't want to say safe, but 
that there are no unwanted litters. Sometimes it's not possible for the pet parents to, to make sure of that. So um, obviously we're not talking about these cases today. So today we're gonna talk about in you know, the perfect scenario where we can be responsible and we can make sure that there are no unwanted litters. What is the best solution for our pets? Spay and neuter, yes or no? Or what are the health complications that can come with both sides? What are the health complications that could arise if we don't spay and neuter? And what is it that could arise if we do spay and neuter? Yeah, those the, that's really the big question. And I would agree with you. We're talking about people who are responsible you know, pet parents and have control over their animals and know where they are at all times, basically, or hopefully. Um, so, you know, and we, we have like a really long time now that we have been able to see, do you have a lot of spayed and neutered animals? So a lot of the studies that have been done more recently are retrospective studies where we basically are looking at you know, groups of animals, you know, dogs especially, uh, where we see that, you know, if those animals are spayed or neutered, they ha are at higher risk for this or the other. Um, so we have all that information now because they're, you know, we've been spaying and neutering dogs for, you know, I was gonna say centuries, but <laughs> not quite, but decades. So we have all that information and um, there's definitely uh, more and more you know, studies being done. And um, just recently I was um, speaking with a colleague of mine and she mentioned that with some breeds now, the recommendation is to not spay or neuter at all. And um, she couldn't give me the, the information on where she had read that. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> she couldn't remember, but Goldens were one of these breeds where they just don't recommend spaying and neutering anymore because the risk of, of them having issues um, or high, uh, being at higher risk for issues um, is, is much greater. There were some other breeds, um, and, you know, one of them is also Bernese Mountain Dog, and um, she, again, couldn't remember all the others, but there were a few breeds where they said spaying and neutering should not be done um, for these animals. And, you know, we, we see issues that arise on on different levels um you know we can have orthopedic issues that can um you know arise from spaying and neutering early uh generally uh when when an animal a dog, and we're talking mostly about dogs here because with cats there haven't been a lot of retrospective studies in that regard and it also doesn't seem that cats are as affected by the removal of hormones as dogs are so most of you know the the studies that I um, have read and and the information I'm giving you is more dogs dog related but can, we can certainly cover cats a little bit as well but um, let's maybe stick to the dogs um, so anyway so for orthopedic um, things they can have delayed closure of um, growth plates because hormones you know sex hormones they help to close the growth plates so that the bones don't keep growing longer and longer and um, different bones have different um, times where the, when they close. So for example, the femur, which is the long thigh bone, um, the growth plates, they close at about eight months of age, whereas the tibia um, keeps growing until about 12 to 14 months of age. So if we were to spay right in between those two closures, you know, we already have a closure of the femur uh, growth plates, but the tibia will continue to grow um, for a few more months, you know, for longer, you know, because they've been neutered. So in the end, we, we, the dog ends up with a disproportionate uh, ratio of femur bone to tibial bone, which then causes a change in the angle of the, of the knee, which then makes them much more prone to cruciate ligament issues because it puts more strain on that cranial cruciate ligament that tends to have so many you know, seems to be prone to being injured. Um, so that's just one thing, you know, growth related. Um, um, delay, uh, spayed and neutered dogs will also tend to be much taller than, you know, the spayed and neutered animals. The radius and the ulna, which are these two bones right here, 
um, they tend to also grow longer, which then could also cause issues with um, elbow dysplasia, where they have, um, you know, a bit of a malformation in that area. Um, hip dysplasia is also more common, um, patellar luxation, and then other types of joint disorders, they're also much more prone to those. So that would be just on the, you know, orthopedic uh, level. So, you know, it's important that we, you know, if a dog has been spayed or neutered, that we really kind of pay closely attention to, to that um, aspect of their health and, and maintenance, basically, which we can get into a little bit later. Um, so we have the orthopedic issues then uh, on a uh, behavioral um, level, there's also um, changes that can occur. Um, dogs that have been spayed and neutered tend to be more noise phobic. Um, so thunderstorms, you know, 4th of July, uh, fireworks or whatever. What's your national holiday? Uh, yeah. New Year's Eve. That's really yeah, popular. Uh, like with with New with uh, fireworks, it would be just New yeah. Year's Eve. Depending uh, depending um, on where you live in Dubai, they do fireworks every single night. Actually, yeah. That's like true. so, we have Global <laughs> Village where they at 9 p.m. every single night they do fireworks. It's, uh, oh so really? Yeah, really every single night, of, like between uh, uh, the winter season. So from. Uh, I don't know, October, no, uh, September. Oh, okay. to, yeah. It's, anyway, it's, really it's not, six yeah. months long. Yeah. <laughs> every we'll, have, we'll have to talk about that because that's interesting too. I'm like, wow, every night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. But you um, know what? That's actually so interesting that you say that right now because Milka, our dog, is very sensitive to noise, and it happened. It. I mean, it very much. Now that I think about it, I I think back. It happened kind of after right after she got spayed she became very very sensitive to noise um especially like bottles and stuff so we thought it was um we thought it was because of an experience that she had uh somewhere but mm -hmm. uh, it could be related to that as well mm -hmm. i actually well i mean the thing is you know when they don't have all the the hormones um like for example, testosterone, we know testosterone gives a lot of energy, you know, uh, if there's no testosterone and you see it in an older man, they start to develop a belly and they don't have that energy anymore. They start slapping, you know, that sort of thing. But testosterone gives a lot of energy. And so an animal or, or a person, you know, if you don't have much energy, you don't feel good, you know, and then you're also much more sensitive to everything that's going on. Um, so if I have good energy, if I slept well and everything, people can throw stuff at me. I'm not too phased. You know, I, I respond in a good way usually. But if I haven't slept well, um, I'm, I'm not in as good as a mood. I'd be more, you know, affected by my environment, what people might say or do, or, you know, it's, you just don't have that that feeling of I feel well and I can handle things. So, you know, noise is one of those things that one may not be able to handle very well as a dog, you know, because you're already like a little bit sensitive and then, you know, you get um, bombarded with noises that can, you know, make it worse, obviously. And that uh, but was when our spayed and neutered dogs, because of the hormone imbalance that they would have. Yeah. Yeah, and they are known to have less energy, you know, so in, in dogs that, you know, sporting dogs, they will definitely, they show less energy when once they're spayed and neutered than their intact counterparts. They just don't, just don't have it, you know. Um, but other behaviors that we can see as well is, you know, under, undesirable sex behaviors such as mounting and, and humping all the time. So that's not just reserved to um, the ones that have hormones, but can be worse with, with dogs that are spayed and neutered, for example. Um, male dogs can also be more aggressive uh, when they're neutered, and females tend to be a little bit more on the fearful side, for example. So just, you know, if basically the the thought that if an animal is aggressive, uh, if we neuter it, then they will feel better or, and be less aggressive, that's actually not the case. Uh, actually, it's, it, that only makes a difference in about 20 to uh, 25 to 35 to 30% of dogs. And I remember when I first, um, you know, started out in my veterinary um, career, 
the first job that I had uh, with with you know a veterinarian, we would always give the male dogs a hormone injection to stop the testosterone to see if would if would it would actually change the um, behavior of the dog, the unwanted behavior. And if it didn't, then we wouldn't neuter. And mm -hmm. you know, back in in Europe, or still actually in Europe, um, spaying and neutering is much less common than it is here. In fact, in some countries like uh, Norway, for example, you're not allowed to spay and neuter unless there's a medical reason, so it's even illegal. Or if you live really close to a busy street or something like that. Um, so there are still countries that don't even allow it. And um, to be honest with you, in, in Switzerland, when I grew up there, and it may have changed now, um, we didn't have a lot of abandoned dogs or dogs that were, you know, straying and um yeah so it's it's not just the spaying and neutering that keeps things under control i think it's just the society and how it it functions basically but anyways going back to behavior um in german shepherds they've also found that they're much more reactive once they've been um desexed um energy levels drop as i mentioned and um the thing is with, with a lot of these behavior studies that were done that showed initially that, you know, spaying and neutering would make a difference, they were significantly flawed. Um, so when we look at studies, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of studies online, you know, that are accessible, but just because a study has been done doesn't mean that it's actually a valid study because studying doing proper study studies is, is not that easy and there are a lot of ones that are either flawed or have a lot of bias where you know whoever did the study was more invested in something and therefore mm -hmm. they're going to gear the way they interpret the results towards that and then there are some researchers who are scrupulous and and will actually remove some of the results just so that the study then shows what they wanted study to show and <laughs> not what it actually would have shown so um, but thankfully there are people who are really good at evaluating studies such as Chris Zink who has done an amazing review of uh, all the studies that were done in the uh, in that on that subject mm -hmm. and um, so yeah I'm very grateful that she's done that and and kind of create an, you know, articles on that subject that are freely available online. And maybe we can post that, a link to that later as well for people who want to uh, do a little bit more research on that and actually read the studies. Yeah, we'll post them in the comment section. Yeah, so anyway, so that's behavior. And then um, obviously they've also done a lot of uh, retrospective looks at um, tumors and cancer in general and they have found that a lot of dogs will and and it depends a little bit on breeds you know there are some breeds that will be more prone to one and other breeds that are not as affected by um, you know early spay and neuter or spay or neuter in general uh, but some of the tumors that were found were hemangiosarcoma for example of the, of the heart um, and then also of the spleen bone cancers, uh, prostate cancers tend to also be more common in neutered animals than um, intact males. Transitional cell carcinoma, which is a bladder cancer, can also be more uh, prevalent in those that have been desexed. And so is, the same goes for lymphosarcoma, mast cell tumors, which are skin tumors. Um, and um, I guess one tumor that we need to look at a little bit because there was a study that was done that showed that if we um, spay and neuter before the first heat, there are they are least likely to get mammary tumors, and then with each heat, they would be more prone to developing mammary cancer. But unfortunately, that study, or fortunately actually, I should say, that study was very uh, biased, and the risk the ultimate risk for mammary tumors is only 0.2%. So very few female dogs will actually develop mammary tumors. And these tumors are, are not mostly not malignant, only about 30% of them are malignant and they can be easily removed. And so the prognosis is, is quite good. 
Um, and compared to other tumors like hemangiosarcoma or lymphoma and these types that are usually fatal, the risk you know, really outweighs the benefit when we look at uh, mammary tumors. So basically for, again, for mammary tumors, the risk is 0.2% only, whereas for all the other types of cancers that spayed females can um, in develop, the risk is 200 to 400%. So two to four times higher risk. So um, I, for anyone who might not uh, know too much about like what the actual t uh, cancer types mean and what it is, um, is it true um, to say that, uh, you know, there are certain, because when we go as a pet parent, when we go to a vet office, the uh, the vets who push for early spay and neuter, they'll always say, uh, or usually always say something like, we need to spay and neuter early because uh, otherwise the risk of cancer is higher. So would it be, um, with the studies that you find uh, conclusive uh, and um, uh, the studies that you follow, uh, would it be correct to say to the, uh, that the, there are certain types of cancers that are more prevalent in dogs who are not spayed and neutered, and there are other types of cancers that are more prevalent in dogs who are spayed and neutered. But the ones who are more prevalent and the ones that are not spayed and neutered are not as um, aggressive mm -hmm. as... Yeah the ones that actually happen or are more mm -hmm. likely to happen in the spayed and neutered animals. Yeah, for example, my dog, she developed mammary tumors, but we, she didn't die of that. You know, she lived up to 16 and she ended up dying of a heart condition. You know, that's more, you know, common in smaller dogs, but she had mammary tumors and we never removed them and she lived with them without a problem. They weren't painful or anything like that. So she was fine. Um, so yes, the, the risk of dying from another tumor such as hemangiosarcoma or lymphosarcoma and these types is much higher. You know, mm -hmm. uh, hemangiosarcoma, they very rarely make it past a few months. Whereas with mammary tumors, they can live a long time which mentioned that are deadly, they are more prevalent in the dogs that are spayed and neutered. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically the risk of cancer in a spayed and neutered dog and the risk of dying of, of, of a tumor is higher. Okay, yeah. So I think that um, brings us to our next topic, which is... Uh, well, I had a few more oh, things okay. that can also happen with... Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm almost here. <laughs> um, anyways, obviously we also have incontinence issues that can arise from being desexed, uh, weight gain. Um, dogs can also be more prone to developing uh, bladder infections, especially the, the females, because especially if they're um, spayed earlier in life, before the first heat, their vulva doesn't develop fully and it's it's still kind of hidden in some folds, we call that a hooded uh, vulva. Um, and so that makes them more prone to, um, you know, to infections as well. And incontinence means that things are a little bit more open so that, so urine can leak. So if urine can leak out, bacteria can also move in. So they're more prone to urinary tract infections as a result. Um, they're also more prone to thyroid uh, hormone deficiency, so hypothyroidism. Uh, they're more prone to infections in, in general, infectious diseases. They're more prone to vaccine reactions. They're also more prone to rolling in poop and eating poop, <laughs> which I'm sure that's disgusting, right? Um, they can also develop fatal acute pancreatitis and um, they can also um, have more scar tissue related issues because anytime we cut into an animal, um, there's a development of, of scar tissue and scar tissue tends to be more of a constriction of, of, of tissue because it, it has to kind of shrink to keep it there. And any scar tissue will have wide, uh, wide um, spread effect because everything is connected in the body through fascia, which is the very thin layer that can, that covers everything, including nerves, organs, 
muscles, tendons, ligaments, everything is covered with this fascia. And this fascia is connected throughout the entire body. So if we cut into something, we disrupt that proper movement of that fascia the way you know it, it can move and so it can it itself can then cause a lot of issues where you know for example they could be more prone to having cruciate ligament issues just because the body isn't work moving as as it should and there's some restrictions um yeah okay i think that's it <laughs> are you sure i think so i didn't want to so if you want to add anything else. Well, no, well, I mean, I think the only other thing is I, I, maybe we should also talk about the risks of not staying in the spring. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we have to weigh the risks and benefits, and that is very individual for each situation. Um, so definitely the risk of, of not um, spaying a female dog is that they can develop pyometra, which is an infection of the uterus. And during the, the heat cycle, a female's um, cervix will be open so that sperm can get in. And at the same time, the immune system is also going to be a little bit weaker in that area during heat cycles, again, so that the sperm can get in and not get killed by the immune system because it's a foreign body in that sense. You know, it comes from a different animal. Um, so basically, the immune system is a, uh, is a little bit lower, the cervix is open, and so it's also possible that bacteria can move in. And with females, every time they go through a heat cycle, there's a buildup of uterine tissue um, that basically prepares for the placenta, it's basically placental tissue. And so if an embryo starts growing, that placental tissue is then used for the embryo. And as the female um, gives birth, that uterine, that extra placental tissue gets expelled with, with the puppies or right after. But if the female does not get pregnant, that uterine, uh, that extra uterine tissue stays in there. And with each heat, it will build up more and more. So you'll end up with thicker and thicker layer of that uterine um, tissue. It just stays in there, and that's perfect breeding ground for mac microbes, for bacteria. So there is a risk that after a heat, about one to two months after the heat cycle is over, that a female can develop pyometra, which is that infection of, in the uterus. And what happens is that after the female is in heat, after she's done, the cervix closes up again. So we have these bacteria in there that fester and, and create pus. Um, you know, because the, the body is trying to respond to that. And so it builds up more and more pus to try to, to get rid of these microbes. But because the cervix is closed, that pus just builds up in there and, and the uterus kind of expands and expands. And, and that's a problem because there's a limit to the expansion of the uterus and then eventually it will rupture. So then um, that pyometra really becomes an emergency uh, where they have to be, um, you know, go have surgery right away to remove that uterus before it, it basically bursts and creates a pussy mess in the abdomen. But we can also have the cervix open a little bit where then pus comes out, you know, through the vulva, and then we also know that they have pyometra. So anyways, that's a bit of a risk with females, um, and that's why we recommend having the uterus removed. And I know we're going to get into, you know, the different options um, in a little bit later, but that's certainly one risk. Um, and then with males, uh, there's obviously the risk of having, of developing testicular cancer, but the risk is not that high either. And, um, you know, if that were the case, then the testicles can be removed at that point. So it's not such a big issue. Um, we can also um, have issues with prostate hyperplasia in male dogs that are not neutered. Um, and again, basically just neutering them will take care of that problem as well. Okay. All right. Um, you know, uh, now one of my questions would be because, um, especially for the female dogs, there seem to be a lot of, um, uh, well, actually not just for the female dogs, both for the female and then male dogs, there seem to be a lot of, um, 
health complication that could arise if we do spay and neuter. So how many of that, like, are they just general side effects of spay and neuter or how much of that can be avoided if we spay and neuter at the right time? Let's say like, you know, that would be the next question. If like what time, if we do decide to spay and neuter, I mean, you, you explained very well that there are, you know, health concerns that come if we do decide to spay and neuter and there are health concerns that come if we do not spay and neuter. So if somebody goes with the um, decision to do the spay and neuter, what, at what time would it be best to spay and neuter um, so that we uh, can avoid as many health issues as possible? Well, um, I just I usually recommend waiting uh, for animals to be fully grown um, until they're done growing, uh, but certainly not to do it between the time where the femur is done growing and the tibia is still continuing to grow. So in that sense, you know, if if it's done early, it should be done before that. You know, before the eight months, um, if that's something that has to be done um, because then at least the bones will kind of continue to grow a little bit more the way they're supposed to. Um, but yeah, I usually recommend waiting mm -hmm. until they're fully grown so that they're fully developed and uh, have uh, some maturity. So just, <laughs> I, I didn't understand what you just said um, with the eight months. because uh, Well, because the femur stops growing at eight months and the tibia grows until about 12 to 14 months. So you, if you're spaying right in between, you know, during that time, um, then you'd actually be causing more growth issues and, you know, issues with the angle um, at the end, you know, because you, the ratio between the femur and the tibia will be different than if you did it before. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I guess for, for me, one of my questions would be like for those pet parents that say, okay, I'm going to go to the vet and I'm going to like ask the question, when does this bone stop growing? Like when typically would this be? I mean, I know every dog is different, like small breed dogs, would their bones would grow differently yeah. than a larger breed dog. Well, one way to figure that out, you know, if you wanted to know for the particular individual is to take x-rays because okay. then you can see if the growth plate has closed or not. So the best advice for um, a pet parent who decides to do the spay and neuter would to ask their veterinarian to do an x-ray to um, ensure that the, bro the bones have finished uh, developing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly you could do that, although I'm not a huge fan of exposing them to x-rays, yeah. you know, when it's not necessary. And, uh, but, you know, we, we do have, we know when, grow, when bones kind of stop growing approximately, mm -hmm. you know, for different breeds. I'm sure there's some information out there that we could um, consult with and then, you know, base it on that. But uh, you would suggest to uh, wait as long as possible? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of waiting until they're fully grown. And for smaller dogs, you know, a year and a half. For bigger dogs, two years and a little bit more. You know, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it, it's all, it all very much depends on the situation. But um, certainly, if an animal can be kept under control and, and there's no particular issue, I certainly recommend waiting or not doing it at all yeah. you know yeah. at least for male dogs mm -hmm. just because it, you know the, the benefits are not very high okay. but again it's very individual if you have a, a male dog that's girl crazy that can be an issue but then again i i've been working with quite a few male intact male dogs now that have shown issues of you know humping excessively going after the female in the house constantly, you know, always wanting to um, get in with her. And, and I have found that if I can balance out their hormones, um, and it can be done very easily through chiropractic work, that's how I do it, 
um, that they that their hormone levels drop back down um, to a level where it's tolerable because it's kind of like you know teenage boys that are sex crazy because their hormones are, are going nuts well that's not how it's supposed to be you know there's supposed to be a bit of a balance same with women you know we, we're not supposed to have PMS signs we, we're not supposed to you know have all these symptoms because that's that's just a sign that there's a hormone imbalance and if we can fix that hormone imbalance then the body can function properly and I've I've had quite a, a few dogs now that I've worked with where I'm, I'm able to just like overnight pretty much change how they behave just with adjusting their hormones because the hormones you know they're being produced and the hormones have to also be you know are used up and and then they get ex, um, destroyed and, and eliminated through the liver so if that process doesn't happen properly then there's a hormone accumulation that can happen in the system that can then drive them crazy basically um, and all the hormone glands also communicate with all the other hormone glands so for example the adrenal glands and the testicles um, communicate with, with each other and it communicates with the thyroid gland it communicates with the pituitary the thalamus uh, or the hypothalamus i should say and the pineal gland so if there's an imbalance anywhere in that hormonal um, you know alignment or hormonal balancing system then you know we we can have issues and so i can work with that and and help rebalance all of that so that all the hormone glands communicate with each other properly and that can then you know create a balance within the system where behavior normalizes as well because just like you know and and for us women it's really easy you know you get you're right before your period and you get all crazy or whatever it may be right um and then once it's done you know it's better but then if you balance out the hormones and you know some women will go for you know hormonal support with um you know birth control pills and which are not the best but you know we, there are ways to kind of balance it out chemically uh, anyways and then we feel better and so the same for for the, the dogs you know if we can balance that out it can make a big difference for them and um it doesn't take much you know sometimes it's just a little bit of a an issue with the growth with the plates of the bow of the skull that are jammed a little bit and so if we can unjam that then the brain works better and the pituitary gland and hypothalamus which are kind of the master glands uh, that control and direct everything um, can function better and then the rest can function better sometimes it's the liver that just needs a little bit of extra support to to be able to um, you know get rid of the excess hormones that are building up um, yeah yeah, yeah. How where were we going with that and <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, the, we were just um, talking about like when was the best time to spay and mm -hmm. to wait as long as possible. And, but it mm -hmm. also, I mean, you, you're already talking about hormonal balancing. So um, shall we go on to the next question of um, actually talking about like when we do have a dog who has been spayed and neutered or neutered <laughs> too early? So for example, Milka, our dog was spayed too early. I think she was spayed around eight months uh, mm -hmm. and before her first heat and we would not do that again if we could do it again. Uh, well, yeah, so, um, you know, we, we know that she is gonna be more prone to certain things like we have to, you know, th uh, put more attention to things like joint support right now and, uh, and uh, urinary tract support and, and certain things. So what people who have spayed their dogs or neutered their dogs too early, what should be, we be putting more attention to and what can we do to prevent as many health issues as possible to support them to have a long and healthy life? um yeah that's a very good question and one that i get very often and 
One of the other hormone glands that also has the ability to make testosterone and progesterone and estrogen are the adrenal glands. So it's very important that we support the adrenal glands because those can kick in. And that's what happens in women when we go through menopause. It's the adrenal glands that will start to kick in and, and make up for some of the hormones that are not being made by the ovaries. So it's very important that we support the adrenal glands. And one way to support the adrenal glands is to decrease stress. So making sure that the stress levels are low. And that's not just emotional, mental stress. That's also stress uh, in the body itself. Because the body, anytime there's a lot of inflammation going on, there's pain, there's just something not functioning right in the body, it causes stress to the body and it, it increases adrenaline and, and cortisol production. And that increase of cortisol production takes away of the adrenal's ability to make um, some of the sex hormones because there are precursors that can go either into making progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, or cortisol. So if that precursor is used mostly to make cortisol because the stress level is high, then all the other hormones are going to be lacking or not being produced as much. So decreasing stress level and, and decreasing the, you know, the excess cortisol production is um, quite important. And that means, again, obviously eliminating emotional stress as much as we can. Um, and that it would include giving them plenty of exercise because that's one way of, of releasing some stress. Decreasing inflammation in the body is very important. And there are so many areas of the body that can cause inflammation, including, um, you know, microbiome imbalances in the gut, uh, leaky gut, for example, um, exposure to toxins, um, vaccines. Um, there are so many things that cause excess um, inflammation in the body. Uh, bad teeth, for example, are a really big, uh, big deal. Um, and that's why I recommend regular dentals. But all of these things can cause inflammation in the body, which then causes stress, which increases cortisol level and decreases some of the other ones. So um, it's very important that we start with that. And I have a, you know, six pillars of health for that, which is you know, diet and uh, nutrition in general. So making sure they get a species appropriate nutrition that is low in carbohydrates because carbohydrates tend to also increase the level of inflammation and so does highly processed foods. Um, they also increase inflammatory markers significantly. So um, diet, uh, and then you know, GI health, which I already mentioned, hormone health, because some of the other hormones can also suffer, including thyroid hormones, for example. So doing some thyroid testing it would probably not be a, a bad idea just to see what the hormone levels, you know, hormones are. Um, on that in that department, um, and I recommend a full thyroid panel, not just a T4 or a TSH, because that does not give nearly um, all the information that is required. Um, so hormones, and then um, you know, making sure the nervous system works properly is important as well, because all of these hormone glands are also innervated um, through the nervous system, including the adrenal glands, the thyroid you know, all of these have nervous input. So making sure that the nervous input to these glands work um, properly. Um, and then, as I mentioned, fitness and exercise. And I think that's six, is it? I think. Well, anyways, six pillars. <laughs> so all of these things have to be in place, you know, and, and work properly. And that will help the hormone glands in general. Uh, to work better, so to create less issues. Oh, detox, I forgot about detox. Well, detoxification is important as well. For one, because we live in a world that's quite polluted with a lot of toxins. Um, so the you know, liver and especially in the kidneys they can use a little bit of extra help uh, for detoxification because that's also where the, the hormones are being processed through. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned adrenal health a lot. So um, what can we do, like a practical tip uh, on, on enhancing adrenal gland? 
So if once all the other things that I just mentioned are in place, there are certainly a lot of, you know, different herbs that can help the adrenal glands, such as ashwagandha, for example. Um, licorice also has um, effects on, on the adrenal glands. And then we also have glandulars. And glandulars are basically the glands that they take from another animal. They grind them up and stick them in a capsule. Um, so there are a little bit of hormones in these, um, you know, glandulars, um, and there are glandulars for pretty much every gland of the body um, that are available. Um, Standard Process, for example, makes one specifically for females and for males. Um, Simplex M or Simplex F for female. Uh, Mercola um, has some as well uh, through Dr. Becker's line. Um, I think it's female um, hormonal support and the male um, glandular support. Um, but there's also some that can be specifically for thyroid, specifically for adrenals. Um, so we do have all these um, glandulars available as well. Awesome. awesome. All right. Uh, anything else that we can be doing? I mean, for joint health as well, right? Like we're we're now focusing on joint health as well for Milka um, as she's mm -hmm. getting older and she's been spayed too early. Yeah, definitely. There are a lot of joint supplements out there, but I think for joint health, one of the most important part is to actually make sure that the whole mechanics are working properly. And that can be um, worked through um, the uh, nervous system again, because the, the muscles, are all innervated through the nervous system. And the muscles are the, the parts that really create stability in a joint. So if we have, let's just say, let's just take my arm here. If, if, the, if the muscles, oh my hand, that'd be easier. If the muscles on this side are weak and these muscles here are strong and have a good tone, it will create an imbalance where then the there's a little more tension on this side than on this side. And you can see how that would kind of misalign the joint, right? So if I have equal, man, <laughs> if I have equal tension on both sides, the, the joint will be aligned. If I have uneven tension, there will be a misalignment of the joint. So a misalignment of the joint will put more pressure on the, on the cartilage on one side and less pressure on the other side. So then it creates wear and tear on one side and not so much on the other side. And that's what then in the long run um, causes joint um, you know, pain and, and arthritis. So with joint things, uh, you know, if we're looking at joint health, we really have to start with very early on and maintaining that balance of the muscles around that joint so that joint can stay properly aligned because when the joint is properly aligned the cartilages don't actually touch because there's fluid in the joint so then basically the joint the, the bones are kind of floating you know with that fluid in between and so then the joint um, you know the cartilage can stay healthy so that's the most important part when we're, we're looking at joint health is that the muscle tension or, or tone is is you know, balanced around that joint. And that is really regulated through the nervous system. Because the nervous system, the nerve itself is like a water hose. If you step on the water hose, there's no water flowing. If you take the foot off the water hose, you have nerve, you know, you have water flowing again. And the same is true for nerves. You know, if you if you have pressure on a nerve because there's another muscle that's a little Tense, for example, then there's going to be less nerve flow into um, the area, or you know, nerve impulses going into the area where they're supposed to go. For example, if we have tight gluteals in a dog, it will put a lot of pressure on the sciatic nerve, and the sciatic nerve innervates pretty much almost the entire hind leg. So, if we have a lot of nerve, <laughs> there a dog back there? You're checking her gluteals. <laughs> Snoring. She's snoring. <laughs> How are your gluteals? <laughs> Anyways, if the gluteals are tense, then we have a lot of impact on, on the rest of the hind leg, and then their muscles are stay. So you can give all the, the you know joint support as far as supplements go as you want, but if the nerve flow to that area is incorrect, all that joint supplement the joint supplements are not going to give you what you're really looking for. So my first go-to is always to work 
on restoring that nerve flow, you know, to restore it so that it goes everywhere, prop, you know, as it should. And I see that all the time in my practice. You know, I have a dog that comes in, oh, he has a hard time jumping in the car. Well, I look at it, usually it's the pelvis that's a little bit misaligned, which then causes that tension in the gluteals. And, you know, we kind of realign that and all of a sudden the jaw dog is able to jump, jump up on things again. So well, as it goes, but if you if you decide that you're gonna go, you think that your dog has arthritis now because it can't jump up on things, then you're gonna try all the joint supplements, and that's not really going to fix the problem, you know, the original problem. So, and uh, the the issue of aligning the body again would that be chiropractic or physiotherapy? What would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I use chiropractic because that's where, what I'm trained in. I use visceral manipulation, which helps with all the scar tissue, you know, because even when we don't have surgery in an animal, there still can be some scar tissue build up, you know, because, for example, if a muscle has been tight for a long time, then the fascia that's surrounding it will also kind of constrict a little bit because it's not just going to be loose there. Um, so that can also help for, you know, for things to function better. And that's also something that I use with, with animals that have been spayed and neutered, to kind of go back to that, um, is to help, you know, loosen up the scar tissue so that the body can, you know, move properly and, and have more fluidity again. Wow, it's, it's honestly, as you speak, you know, I just think so much about all of the, the dogs that we're helping right now, and I'm wondering, like, like, could this be related to a spay neuter or like, and, and how can we, you know, support still the body? And, you know, we've spoken already about, you know, the six pillars of longevity and how to improve the health. And, and I can't believe like, like how these things can still support even dogs that have been uh, spayed and neutered in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's even more important for those almost yeah. you know because they are lacking things but you know maybe we need to chat, chat a little bit about the different options that we have as yeah. well um you know if you have to do something uh, because some puppies they come with a contract mm -hmm. and the contract says has to be spayed or neutered by such and such age yes. um yeah. so in those cases um there are alternatives uh, for example, for male dogs, we can do vasectomies. Um, so that basically takes out their ability to reproduce. So we can do that. Um, though, if there's no contract and there are no, there's no risk of impregnation, it's really not a, a procedure that I recommend because all it does is it creates scar tissue. You know, they will still have the hormones, so that hasn't changed. So if you're trying to do something for behavior, obviously, you know, doing a vasectomy is not going to change the behavior because the hormones are still there. So the only time I recommend a vasectomy is if you have an escape artist, you know, um, although in that case, you may be better off neutering the dog if he tends to just run after females all the time because obviously the ultimate goal is to keep them alive, mm -hmm. um, you know, and not get run over by a car. Um, but anyway, so with male dogs, we have the option of doing vasectomies. And then with female dogs, um, we have the option of only taking the uterus out, which is a hyster hysterectomy and is also known as ovary sparing space. So basically we spare the ovaries, we leave them in and we remove the uterus. But what we need to know um, is that females that have, you know, where the uterus was removed, they still have all the hormones. So they will still go through heat. They can still um, have signs of false pregnancy because that's one, you know, thing that can happen. Um, you know, when they're not spayed, period. Um, they can have false pregnancies, which is a very natural thing. Um, I don't want to go too deeply into that, but they can have that. They can still have a little bit of discharge because the vaginal tissue will still create a little bit of discharge when they go into heat. Um, and they are still a little bit more prone to having mammary um, tumors as a result. So um, they're 
they basically just don't have the uterus anymore, but everything else pretty much stays the same. Although I have to mention that, you know, since ovary sparing space are a little more recent um, types of, you know, procedures that we do, we don't have a lot of retrospective studies. And I did read a study about rats where they um, compared memory um, abilities uh, um, between rats that were intact, both had ovaries and uterus still um, present, rats that, where the ovaries were removed and the uterus was removed, and then another group where they only removed the uterus and left the ovaries in. And the ones that had a ovary sparing spay, they actually fared the worst as far as memory went. So they had the least, you know, their memory was the worst of, of the whole group. Because we do have a feedback between the uterus and the ovaries. So if the ovary, the uterus is removed, there's a feedback that's missing. And we don't really know yet what's going to happen, you know, of that because most female dogs are still being spayed the regular way where they take both out. And I do have a friend, for example, also who um, she had her uterus removed, but the ovaries were still there, and she went into menopause, even though the uh, ovaries were still there. Now she has some other issues as well, uh, you know, physical issues that probably contributed to that. Um, but again, you know, with the ovary sparing space, we just don't know quite enough yet. And one other disadvantage uh, with the ovary sparing spay is that we have to actually open the dog, you know, like do a real incision all the way. And it's a little bit of a longer incision than in a regular spay or even in a laparoscopic spay where we just make one little incision and then just go in with an apparatus um, to do that, which would be the least invasive, but that cannot be done with ovary sparing spays because with the ovary sparing spay, we have to remove the cervix as well. So that makes it a little bit of a longer, uh, requires a longer incision. Because if we leave the cervix in there, there could also be a tiny piece of the uterus still attached to that cervix. And that little piece of uterus is still responding to the hormones and can build up that extra material that I mentioned earlier and create a pyometra as a result, which we then call a stump pyometra because it's just that little stump that's left. And because now this little stump just kind of sticks out into the abdominal cavity and there's nothing, you know, it's not, you know, wrapped, um, that can then cause a lot of issues as well. So we have to take out the cervix in order to make sure that we take, you know, the entire, that really the entire uterus is gone. Um, so we have to make sure you know, to do that, and that requires a longer incision. And then once a female um, has been ovary sparing spade, <laughs> uh, we, we, she cannot have intercourse. So that doesn't mean that she can have safe sex just because there is no chance of, of pregnancy. Because with removing the cervix, we also shorten the whole vaginal mm -hmm. um, tract because when they're in heat, the cervix is open, so the penis has a little further to go. So um, if they were mounted by a, a male dog, there could be a potential for trauma in the vaginal um, canal, and that could also then end up with sperm going into the abdominal cavity if there's a full rupture. Um, so there's definitely no safe sex um, after that. Wow, that sounds like a lot of, wow. I didn't imagine that. So it's it's much, much different for female dogs than it is for uh, male dogs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so with female dogs, it's definitely a little bit more involved. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they do have the risk of pyometra. I mean, my, my own childhood dog, we, she was intact. I grew up in Switzerland, so, you know, we didn't spay or neuter our dogs unless absolutely necessary for whatever reason. Um, and she developed pyometra when she was 10 years old. And I, I remember very clearly, I went into the forest with her the, the same day, you know, we went for like a two, two hour hike. And then by the afternoon, she was on, on the table getting surgery. So yeah. that's how quickly things, I mean, it's not that it developed this quickly, but that's how quickly um, things can change to the point where, yeah, now we need emergency surgery. 
And um, if we wait too long, you know, they can have major issues because they, they can have kidney injury as a result of pyometra. They can obviously have a rupture of the uterus into the abdominal cavity, which is never good. Um, so yeah. pyometra is an emergency. So mm -hmm. definitely not wait. So if you have a, a female that's intact and you're just waiting, <clears throat> or you just want to wait and see, or you just don't want to do anything, um, then you definitely want to make sure you keep very close attention to um, any signs of pyometra, which would be increased drinking and urinating, um, lack of appetite, vomiting, pus leaking out of the vagina, um, you know, out of the vulva, bloated abdomen, uh, panting, weakness, you know, um, collapse, you know, these types of things. And usually it's about one to two months after they've had a, a uh, after they were in heat. So that's kind of the time where you want to pay particular attention to your female. That's good. That's good information. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, as I always like to say, when, when people ask me or us, um, like, should I neuter? When should I neuter? There's, there's no, uh, like, it's a very personal decision. You really can't say it's best to do this. It's best to do that. Like, you know, I think you've had a really good, like we've explained or you've explained very well, um, like all the, you know, pros and cons with both options and all options. So uh, we hope that everyone has a really good um, understanding now. And we have lots of questions. So Larry, you have? Yeah, we, we yeah. Uh, gather some questions. Some of the questions have been answered already throughout the last. Um, so we're going to hit on some uh, questions, starting with Amanda. Uh, she says she has a four and a half year old male intact. He started urinating some blood. Uh, she took him to the vet with, uh, and the x-rays confirmed that he has an enlarged prostate. And uh, he was told, uh, she was told that he needs to be neutered to fix the issue. And once neutered, it should shrink. Are there any alternatives? Will this put him at risk for prostate cancer? Well, um, if I were to be able to get my hands on a, on a dog with an enlarged prostate, I would um, certainly, depending on obviously the signs, because if they can't urinate, that's a problem. Um, because the prostate, when it enlarges, it will start to push on the, um, on the urinary uh, tract, you know, on the, uh, urethra and if they can't pee then that's a big problem mm -hmm. uh, but if if they can still urinate and it's enlarged then i would certainly start working with hormones and see if i can help with um you know on a hormonal level as i described earlier to see you know if, if the metabolism of the hormones is is not um you know doing well enough um if i can do some liver detox and things like that and with an enlarged prostate, I would also want to know, is there an infection going on? Because if there's an infection, then it may be possible to just treat the infection. And then the prostate would also shrink um, a little bit. So it would depend a little bit on the situation, basically. But certainly, you know, if they can't urinate and, and it's more of an emergency, you know, that's kind of important, you know, that they can do that. Um, so in the end, you have to kind of risk uh, weigh the, the risks and benefits of each um, of that because we do want to keep the dog alive. We don't want it to end up with a burst bladder either. That's That would not be good. Um, certainly they are at higher risk for certain tumors after that. Um, but, you know, we also live in an environment that's not really promoting health all that much these days. So, the risk of, for you know tumors is is elevated for every everyone, including us humans, um, these days. I hope that sort of answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question from Leslie. Uh, she is asking, or she's saying that her dog. Milka wants to come up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Milka wants to come up to the couch. So Leslie yeah, yeah. asked, uh, Charlie started reacting to sudden noises by howling. 
It happened overnight after he was castrated at nine months. I'm convinced it was the cause. Is there anything I can give him to help? Yeah, well, you know, what I mentioned earlier about the different, you know, glandulars that we can do, um, it may also be worth um, consulting with a classically trained veterinary homeopath um, because I do have some dogs that have homeopathic support when it comes to these types of things. So certainly something I would look at. Um, probably some hormone testing would be appropriate as well, such as checking what the thyroid levels are doing because noise phobia and thyroid, low thyroid levels can be part of that as well. Um, there's certainly also you know, herbal support that we can give, such as ashwagandha, uh, that also help with um, just stress in general uh, for the animal to be less stressed. Um, CBD oil, you know, those types of things. But um, certainly I would probably do a little bit of testing um, and, and possibly work with a homeopath on that because they can also help with that and glandulars. Okay. Um, and then we have um, Tatiana. She's, say, she's asking or saying that her uh, dog just went into her first heat and two to three weeks preceding um, that she got way more jumpy, um, scared, unsettled, leash, leash reactive, um, mm -hmm. barking at people. She never did it before. Um, would it, wouldn't it be easier for her to get spayed? Well, sure, that's, that could be the easier way uh, of handling it, but the risk of other things are, are there as well. Um, again, when, just like in, in humans, you know, when women go in through their first menstrual cycle, it's, it's usually a bit unpleasant until the body sort of gets, you know, regulated. So if they are, are having symptoms around their heat cycle, that is abnormal, then I would want to look at what kinds of hormonal imbalances are present. And, you know, I mentioned the, you know, that earlier, and I use muscle testing to do that. So I would certainly work with that rather than jumping for um, spaying right away, especially in a young dog, you know, I'd want to wait until she's at least fully grown before um, spaying. Yeah. Yeah. But there are things that can be done. And, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, you just get through it. I mean, it's not like it's it's happening forever, you know, it's maybe a couple of weeks or so. But I've also seen dogs that had major issues and, and especially major issues afterwards with um, false pregnancies. Um, so, you know, there may be, there's certainly some dogs where it can be beneficial, um, but uh, I would want to look at the hormones first and, and you know, check balance first. Mm -hmm um so yeah that's yeah that's a, a really great point um and you know it takes some some dogs it takes them a couple three heats or so just to kind of get regulated you know it's just it's a big change from going to not having a whole lot of sex hormones going through the system and then all of a sudden having a ton of them and i mean we see it you know with our teenagers right <laughs> it's like oh my god can you be done with it already you know and we don't just grab the knife and say let's just chop off the hormone <laughs> plants uh, you know so it's it's an adjustment you know but if they do have symptoms if they are more reactive or whatever they may be it's worth having a look at the hormone balance no, that's really, honestly, a, a really great point, and and I'm really happy that you 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 mentioned it like this because like a lot of the times for a lot of pet parents, you know, their dog might go through the first cycle, and then now they're like, oh my goodness, my dog is absolutely crazy. Let me go just mm -hmm. get the do the spay or neuter. Um, mm -hmm. and the, like yeah, you said it can get better as more cycles happen. Yeah, it's just that most of the time, you know, people don't really know what alternatives there are. Mm -hmm. So that's what they do. And, and most veterinarians don't have some of the tools that I have mm -hmm. and aren't aware of it. So, you know, I understand that, you know, that that's kind of the first go to. So um, I'm glad that Tatiana asked the question because it's a really good question. And it's it's uh, certainly there's a lot that we can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, Laurel Forth is asking, 
uh, I feed my dog raw. Are there certain organs I can feed her specifically to help support her? She's a large breed and was spayed at 8.5 months. Um, yeah, uh, there are some companies that sell testicles. Um, so you could certainly add a little bit of that. And you said spayed or neutered? Yeah, spayed at nine, uh, at 8.5 months. Yeah, so testicles would probably be a little bit more for the males. Although, you know, when a female eats a rabbit, a male rabbit, the testicles will be included as well. So, you know, they benefit from that too. But yeah, there are certainly, I, I'm not familiar of any, um, uh, ovaries, you know, any um, companies that sell ovaries, but I know that it was either it was my pet carnivore or hair today, gone tomorrow, or one of these um, that was selling you know, goat, goat or sheep testicles. <clears throat> but, you know, you'd have to kind of figure out a little bit how much to give because, you know, you wouldn't want to give the whole testicle all at once. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yikes. Because that would be way too much. So you'd probably have to look at, you know, take like a small little bunny and kind of see how much testicle is there and how much of that bunny they would eat in one, you know, sitting. And how often would they get a male bunny versus a female bunny? Um, so it's certainly not something that you would want to give all the time. And, you know, yeah, it's not something you would give all the time. I wouldn't want to die. In the testicles and and yeah, with the heart, with ovaries, yeah, we don't have that. But what? <laughs> <laughs> Some male joke coming? <laughs> no, I said I wouldn't want to um, cut that up and portion it uh, like during meal prep. All the time. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. The logistics of meal preparation. <clears throat> grams did you say <laughs> yeah i mean I, I did create a list somewhere where you know where i basically checked how much percentage of the body weight of an animal of a, of a prey is liver how much is kidney how much is heart how much is you know um testicle and you know the percentage is very small on, on the you know on the hormone glands mm -hmm. And again, it depends as well on, on how well the adrenal glands are working and how much they're kicking in. So unfortunately, there's no real straightforward answer on, on any of these things. I think, you know, if, if somebody is good at muscle testing, they, I guess they could muscle test every day to see if the animal needs it. And I have some clients who know how to do muscle testing. And so they, they just kind of check you know, does it need it today or not? And if it doesn't need it today, then they skip it, you know? So that would be one way of accessing the body's intelligence to figure out um, if it's needed. Because, yeah, there's just no straightforward answer, unfortunately, on that. Um, Victoria is saying, I have an 11 month old standard dachshund uh, marking in the house. Is he old enough to neuter? So this is probably the same um, kind of question as Tatiana asked. Um, it's a behavioral issue that. Yeah, I would I would certainly look at um, hormone level. I mean hormone balancing first. I would kind of try to do my magic there, um, and then if the issue is still present, then I would. Um, reconsider but you know it's also a training issue so you want to um, make sure that you train your dog properly as well maybe work with a trainer mm. um, all right um, how can we is there any specific way that we can prevent uh, pyometra like any way that we can improve uh, the immune system anything that we can do to prevent pyometra Katya is asking. Um, well, one way that nature prevents pyometra from occurring is to have puppies and then giving birth and then you know releasing all that extra tissue um, because that cleans out the uterus basically. But obviously that's not you know feasible with most dogs because we don't want to 
you know, promote more dogs on this planet than we really need. Um, to be honest with you, I don't work with enough female dogs that are intact and aren't being bred. So I'm not sure, um, but certainly making sure that they, their immune system is strong, you know, addressing all the six pillars again would be very important. Um, and then, you know, probably paying special attention to making sure that the hormones are being detoxed properly. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know for sure. I don't have enough experience with that mm -hmm. or any really. All right. Um, any more questions? <clears throat> No, I think, I mean, like, honestly, yeah. Dr. Odette, thank you so much for all of this information. Like, like you've, you've hit on so many points and, and really have our minds going, you know, so when we think about why do so many dogs have so many different types of issues. And one of the things I always think about is like all of the dogs with like joint issues. And now it's, it's starting to make a little bit more sense when, in terms of when do we think about when do these dogs get spayed or neutered? It, it kind of makes sense. And I'm happy to know that there are things that we can do to still continue to at least support the body, um, even if a dog has been spayed or neutered at an early age. Uh, so thank you. Really mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one thing we just need to know, it's not the end of the world. If it's yeah. done, it's done, you know, and then you just have to deal with it and do the best that you possibly can with, with what you have, you know. I mean, nothing is perfect. I mean, even a, a non, you know, an intact dog can still have issues. Yeah. You know, it doesn't prevent things. It's just that when they are spayed and neutered, there's a, just a higher risk, but it doesn't mean that every dog is going to have issues, you yeah. know. Yeah. All right, so uh, there are lots of more um, questions, but they're all kind of um, uh, already answered throughout the live. So if uh, you feel like your question wasn't answered and you're, uh, you joined uh, a little bit in the live already, we would really recommend you to maybe watch it from the start again because we've covered all these questions like uh, when to spay, if to spay and neuter and all of these uh, questions. So thank you again so, 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 so much, Dr. Odette. Uh, this was so amazing as always. And if anybody wants to find out more about the uh, six pillars of health, we actually did a YouTube video, uh, an interview with Dr. Odette where she talked all about that um, you can watch that on Podega, the YouTube channel, and you can, of course, find uh, the online course from Dr. Odette at uh, uh, Peak Animal Health Center. Center. Yeah. Com. Yeah. And soon to be a new website name, you said. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be odettesuterdvm.com. Okay. And I'm posting the link for, for the article for um, Chris Zink. Okay, uh, Dr. Yeah. Chris Zink, right in the comments now as well, okay. so that you guys have it. Thank you. But so yeah, much. awesome. Yeah, awesome. no, thanks so much for having me and you know doing all this great educational work. It's just so 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 needed and appreciated. And well, it's always nice to see your faces and see all the people. I know it's always similar people who are showing up at these um, lives, and I love you guys all. It's good to see you. It's like having family, you know. And yeah. Family, especially now with this whole COVID thing, where you can't yeah. get to see anyone hang out much. Yeah, so, I know. I mean, it's I'm, just really I'm, neat, you know. I'm eager to attend the next event wherever it might be. So, and whenever it might happen. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, again, going a little stir crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you so, so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Dr. Odette, and we will see you all again. Yep. Bye. Bye.